Hello there friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan. Today we continue our Cost of Starship series by taking a look at the Galactic Empire's infamous Starfighter Corps. So far we've covered the cost of Rebel Alliance Starships and Capital Ships in two videos, so check out those videos. We'll link the playlist for them down below in the description. Also, don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button down below so you don't miss out on the rest of the series. Now, the Galactic Empire is known for its tyranny, which is enforced by its massive military-industrial complex. Now, I would argue that the Galactic Empire was also a mass manufacturing and efficiency expert. Because patrolling an entire galaxy, even if you're as large as the Galactic Empire, is an impossible feat. And so, the Empire's Starfighter Doctrine was not based entirely on tactical or even strategic needs. Imperial Brass focused more heavily on affordability and streamlining the production process. And so, with a TIE Fighter line, you'll see some similarities with Incom. Most of the TIE Fighters shared very similar controls, they had shared parts and components, and it was easy for mechanics to get certification across the entire line of Starfighters if they were at least familiar with one of the TIE Line Fighters. But as the Rebel Alliance continued to grow in power and the Galactic Civil War turned into a more open shooting war, the TIE Fighter line of Starfighters was basically stretched to its limits. In the first few years of the Empire, we have to remember that the military went through a huge transition process from the Grand Army of the Republic to the Galactic Empire military. And so many of the first fighters bearing the Empire symbol were Clone Wars era starfighters, and many of the pilots were still clones. The Alpha 3 Nimbus class B-Wing was a Quad Systems Engineering entry into the war. It combines the delta-shaped hull of the Delta 7 and ETA Actus utilized by the Jedi, and combines it with a pair of S-foils, which are aligned to the hull in a very similar way to the future TIE fighter. The V-Wing also featured twin ion engines, which is exactly what TIE in TIE Fighter stands for. The V-Wing was mainly created as a reaction to the Battle of Coruscant, where the much larger three-person crew ARC-170 suffered terrible losses against agile drone fighters. The Republic Brass, which would turn into the Imperial High Command, would change their starfighter doctrine in favor of smaller and more maneuverable ships. The V-Wing fit the bill, but also signaled the end of many creature comforts that Imperial pilots once enjoyed. For instance, the V-Wing was not pressurized, and so the pilot had to wear an evac suit at all times. The ship also didn't have a hyperdrive. And at a steep price of 120,000 credits per unit, the V-Wing was almost twice the price of a V-19 Torrent Starfighter, which it was replacing. And so the Alpha 3 Nimbus would be replaced as soon as the TIE Fighter line was ready. The TIE Fighter prototype would be the future of the Empire. It was developed by Wraith Senyar, head of Senyar Fleet Systems. Interestingly enough, Senyar Fleet Systems was a very unknown and small manufacturer of starships during the Clone Wars era. But Wraith Senyar had close ties to Moff Wilhuff Tarkin, and so he fell into favor with the Empire shortly after the war ended. Senior Fleet Systems began designing more experimental and exotic ships like Palpatine's own pleasure craft, the Imperialist, which was rumored to be a custom job designed by Senyar himself. Senior Systems would also develop the Carrion Spike Corvette, an extremely expensive and high-tech fully cloaked stealth ship for Wilhuff Tarkin. Eventually, Wraith Senior's TIE Fighter prototype would be selected as the mainline fighter for the Galactic Empire. The TIE LN, or the TIE Line, or TIE In Space Superiority Fighter, would be one of the most widely manufactured starfighters in galactic history. It could be found in every corner of the Empire, stationed on tiny remote outposts in the Outer Rim, or inside of massive Super Star Destroyers guarding the core. But this wasn't a one-size-fit-all type of multi-purpose starfighter like the T-65X went. The TIE LN was painfully limited because of cost-saving issues with its design, and also the Imperial Navy's doctrine, which relied on large battleships for most of its operations. The TIE LN was mainly dedicated to light interception duties. This became increasingly important once ship designers realized that the Empire's Star Destroyer fleet, for the most part, lacked adequate point defense weapons. The TIE LN was a very capable dogfighter, but its limited range, lack of uh, hyperdrive, heavy weapons, shields, and even life support were an extreme that the Empire imposed on its ironically very well-trained and talented pilot pool. And unfortunately, a lot of very talented Imperial pilots lost their lives because the TIE Fighter lacked some very standard safety features that you could find on other ships. It's not to say that the TIE Fighter was a garbage fighter. I mean, the Rebels really did respect this Starfighter. It was dangerous. Plus, its airframe design, which almost lacked any moving parts, meant that only 5% of TIE Fighters were lost as a result of field attrition. 
I mean, those numbers would change in the last few years of the war when the Empire's logistical system falls apart, but this was really a superbly designed ship from a manufacturing, maintenance, and logistical standpoint. Even the Imperial pilots and their TIE fighters were highly exchangeable. You weren't just assigned one specific TIE fighter, you just got one that was fueled up and ready to go. And so the Empire's tyranny here looks a lot more like an efficient corporation like Amazon, which boils down its manpower into numbers and figures on an app. But to write off this spectacular cost-saving engineering marvel just because it's underperformed at a few battles is most unfortunate. The standard TIE fighter only costs 60,000 credits, about two to three times less than an X-Wing or an A-Wing. And while I like X-Wings and A-Wings more than the TIE fighter, I'm not gonna take those ships over three TIE fighters. It's just not a fair match. Another early TIE fighter was the TIE SA Bomber. This was a slightly larger and better armored craft, which featured a second munitions pod, which was full of proton torpedoes, bombs, and other goodies. The TIE Bomber was mainly designed to go up against heavy fortifications or larger capital ships, but since the Empire faced a small mobile rubble group and guerrilla tactics, the TIE Bomber's role became less important. They had to take part in punitive campaigns against civilian centers, like when the Empire executed the Knight of a Thousand Tears on Mandalore. The TIE Bomber costs around 150,000 credits, which is actually quite expensive and probably limits how much this bomber is going to be deployed. You'll only see it in special situations. The TIE IAD Interceptor was a direct reaction to the RZ-1A wing, one of the fastest sub-light speed starfighters of all time. The ship featured the bent wing shape of the prototype TIE Advance flown by Vader, combined with an upgraded power plant making it almost as fast as an A-Wing. The Interceptor also featured four wingtip cannons, which were extremely deadly and could quickly overwhelm the shields of Rebel fighters. The TIE Interceptor did give the Empire an advantage against the Rebellion for a short period of time, but its lack of shields and hyperdrive meant that it suffered from many of the same problems that the standard TIE Fighter did. Plus, the Interceptor cost 120,000 credits, twice as much as the standard TIE. The TIE RB Heavy Starfighter was an odd attempt to make the TIE Fighter less TIE Fighter-like. Nicknamed the TIE Brute, the TIE Heavy Starfighter was equipped with life support and a pressurized cockpit. It also had a reinforced transparent steel viewport. The cockpit was off-centered and a heavier HS 9.3 blaster cannon was added to the ship. Originally, Imperial designers had tried to place this larger blaster cannon on the standard TIE, but it just did not fit. And so that is why we have the TIE Brute now. Apparently, military brass wanted more powerful standard weapons so that the TIE fighter didn't need support ships on missions. The TIE Heavy ended up costing around 90,000 credits, but it was slow, clunky, it lacked shields, and heavily underperformed on the battlefield. The TIE Experimental Air Superiority Fighter is probably one of my favorite TIE Fighters, simply because it looks like it can at least generate a little bit of lift with its S-foils. By the way, the reason why TIE Fighters can even fly in atmosphere is because of a technology known as inertial dampeners. They're used to create artificial gravity bubbles around the ship so that pilots don't turn into a bloody mess from abrupt turns, and starships don't fall apart when they clearly aren't aerodynamic and trying to fly through atmosphere. The wind resistance, however, is always a problem, and the TIE Fighter's large solar panels act like sails in the crosswind when it hits it. The TIE Experimental Air Superiority Fighter addressed that problem by redesigning the S-foils into a more suitable blade shape. It immediately became one of the best atmospheric fighters in the galaxy, with an impressive top speed of around 1,500 kilometers per hour. Which I know, compared to our own technology, is not that fast, but we have to remember that in the Star Wars galaxy, they seem to have lost the art of aerodynamics a long time ago. Plus. 1,500 kilometers is still breaking the sound barrier, so that's kind of nice. This TIE Experimental costs around 50,000 credits new, making it actually cheaper than the standard TIE Fighter, and it even had additional heavy lasers and a proton bomb chute for ground attack. The ship also featured a bombardier in addition to the pilot, which wasn't a big problem for the Empire. They didn't really have a manpower issue. That was more of the Rebel Alliance's problem. The TIE Reaper Attack Lander borrows from the design of our previous air superiority fighter. It has similar lift-creating wings that carries a large compartment that can hold an entire rifle squad. Unlike the Lambda Clans shuttle, the TIE Reaper was an assault lander. It's designed to take heavy fire and insert elite spec op units into frontline situations or behind enemy lines. 
The TIE Reaper lacked the dogfighting skills of other ships in its class like the U-Wing, but it still managed to do its job, which was transporting soldiers under heavy fire to the battlefield, very well. It cost around 140,000 credits new and 60,000 credits used. The Lambda Class T-4A was the most common shuttle used by the Empire. Interestingly enough, the multi-purpose transport was considered a relatively elegant and luxurious ship. It had a well-appointed interior that looked more suited for diplomats and politicians than it does for a squad of sweaty stormtroopers about to hit the AO. The Lambda Class also cost $140,000 like the TIE Reaper. Both of these ships had a Class 1 hyperdrive, they had great shields, armor, and an assortment of weapons on board. The Lambda Class, however, had folding wings, which took up less space on ships, and it was more commonly used by high-ranking officers and the regular military. Senior Fleet Systems would attempt to design more advanced starfighters to take on the robust snub fighters used by the Rebel Alliance. You had the TIE Advanced V-1 flown by the Inquisitors with their curved S-foils. It was one of the first TIE fighters to have shields and a hyperdrive. A class 4.5 hyperdrive, but still, it's hyperdrive. At 150,000 credits, though, the TIE Advance underperformed compared to its similarly priced Rebel counterparts. You also have the TIE Advance X-1. This was a smaller profile TIE fighter, which was also shielded and had a small hyperdrive. This was priced at 160,000 credits. Both of these TIE fighters were far too expensive for mass deployment, and at the same time, they didn't perform well enough to really change the course of the war. Then came the TIE Defender, a product of Grand Admiral Thrawn, who had been dealing with an exceptionally nasty rebel outbreak in the Lothal sector. Thrawn was a huge critic of the Emperor and Tarkin's Death Star plans. He believed that what the Empire needed was a multi-purpose elite starfighter, which when widely deployed can significantly decrease the operational capacity of rebel cells. The TIE Defender and the elite version of the TIE Defender were amongst some of the best starfighters ever to be built. You can identify one of these ships by their tri-wing S-fold designs. The TIE Defender Elite came to fruition because of Darth Vader himself. He enjoyed flying the regular Defender so much that he actually gave Thrawn notes, which included extra weapons and some simpler control schemes. This starfighter would prove to be a headache for every Rebel snub fighter it encountered. Not even the X-Wing stood a chance against this thing. The TIE Defender featured heavy shields, armor, a Class II hyperdrive, and no less than eight laser cannons mounted wing tip along with missile launchers. But the original Defender cost a whopping 300,000 credits new, and the Elite version added an additional 10,000 credits to the price. This starship, unfortunately, came way too late to the Empire in too few numbers. And when Grand Admiral Thrawn was assaulted by hyperspace-traveling whales and whisked back to the Unknown Region, the TIE Defender program would also fall. He was its sole defender aside from Vader, and the project was competing for resources with the Death Star, which unfortunately became the main focus for the Empire. So there you have it, guys. That is our list of Imperial Starfighters. As you can see, the Empire struggled with finding balance between quality and also that cheap price they're looking for in order to deploy that massive military presence. Let me know in the comment section below what you think about these ships. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button down below so you don't miss out on the rest of the series. As usual, thanks for joining us today. My name is Alan. I'll see you next time.